welcome to another episode of Crosstalk. My name is Kevin Tachi, and I will be your host for the next 30 minutes. Now, as you've come to know this particular program, we, we do our best to serve the two towns of Whitman and Hanson and provide you with a good conversation and guests, whether it's on upcoming events, might be an issue or a topic in one of the two towns we serve, or it might be a community event, and I think that's where we're going to circle today, as we have an upcoming community event, and you might recognize a couple of the folks who were with me. They were here, I want to say about a year ago, uh, starting uh, closest to me, we have Jen Spagone. Hi, Kevin. In the middle is the troublemaker, Mr. Nathan Fogg. Hi, Kevin. And we have a new to the set. Matt Torrance. Hello, Kevin. Welcome to uh, Crosstalk, or as I'm tempted to say, Coffee Talk, because we were kind of <laughs> chatting with, with Jen a little, because uh, she was kind of uh, remembering the mm -hmm. uh, Saturday Night Live skit. Reason why we're here talking is, is that, uh, if you remember a year ago, we had both Nathan and Jen here, and we were talking about their stage adaptation of, of a novel that was put together by one Charles Dickens called A Christmas Carol, mm -hmm. and you gave us an idea as to what led to the stage adaptation. If you will, let's remind folks what led you to uh, writing your own version of uh, A Christmas Carol. We'll start with you, Jen. Well, <coughs> we decided we'd like to um, stage A Christmas Carol, that it was something that we had never uh, attempted to do before. And we were talking about what script would we use. And we decided that um, because it's a public domain, and you can write an adaptation yourself that we'd, we'd give it a try, that we'd, we really enjoy this uh, piece of work by Charles Dickens, mm. and we thought that we would give it a go. It was the idea to kind of maybe add a dimension to this timeless classic? Well, I think the goal was to present it the way that the book presents it, okay. and to stay true to um, what Dickens had written originally and to try to incorporate as much of that uh, Dickensian language as we possibly could. How did it come, was it a, matter, a time that you two just happened to be thinking about what should the next show be? Was there, like you just looked at Nathan, was it one of those where Nathan looked at you, you looked at Nathan, go, you know, what was, what was the moment? Nathan? I don't really know, we kind of have, Jen and I have production meetings like every couple of hours every day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. true. No, it's true. It's we true. talk a lot. I, I would say that we probably talk on average about two hours a day about theater. Mm -hmm. Every day, even when we're not doing a show. It's your lives. Yeah, yeah. that's not an so, exaggeration. And whether it's researching or going to see something that's coming out so we can get a feel for something we want to do. Um, and when this one came around, you know, as a any theater, really at the nuts and bolts of it is a business, right? You have to produce things people want to see. And A Christmas Carol is one of those things that people want to see. They want to start their Christmas season with it. Sure. You know, people make traditions out of it, similar to going to see the Boston Ballet do the Nutcracker. There are people I know that have seen Boston Ballet do the Nutcracker every year for their whole lives. Mm -hmm. Their families get all dolled up and go in, you know. Yeah. Um, and so we were looking to maybe tap into the Christmas time theater going audience. Um, and we thought, what better? than a production of A Christmas Carol, because it is public domain, so you don't necessarily have to pay royalties, which is huge for yeah. a theater, you know, and you can make it your own. You can incorporate the music you want to incorporate. You can come at it from the angle that you want to. Um, and like Jen said, we really wanted to stay true to Dickens' language uh, and not, you know, dumb it down. So a lot of the language in the script, I mean, it's right out of the book. And so it'll, while some of it will be familiar to people, there's gonna be a lot of it that's like, hmm, what does that mean? Oh, I know, what the, I know where this is, because they know the story. And that, that enables us to stay true to language, because you already know what's going on in A Christmas Carol. Mm. You know, every, pretty much everybody has a basic idea of how the story's going, what the scenes are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of stay true to the Dickens language and not worry that translation is going to be lost, because everyone already has a preconceived notion about what's going to happen, okay. you know? Let's, uh, let's add Matt into to, to the mix here, and uh, folks might be saying, well, why are you adding Matt in? I'm adding Matt because, Matt, I believe you're, you're not only, you've been nominated, but you've, been a, you've won an award for 
Some of your performances are strictly just nominated. I've been nominated for, for um, let me see, I think for the Dash Awards, it was for Bat Boy, the okay. musical, sure. for Bat Boy. In and three then nominations. Right? Yes, yes, no wins yet. But, well, let's we'll get there. Oh, me either. Oh, wait, I wait, know, wait, Susan wait, Lucci. Wait, but don't dub him the Susan Lucci just yet. Yeah. Not just yet, but, no, but you... He's Susan Lucci. Uh, that's How what you many want? times now, Nathan? <laughs> like 15. 15. Yeah. Yeah. A couple more and you'll get there. Right? We didn't wait. Take I her did like I, well, I won one. Oh, there you I go. Did. I got, well... Wait, that was an honorable mention, wasn't it? No, okay. no. It was, <laughs> I, I kind of... It was, it was a special <laughs> award. So what they do, the consultants do a consultant's Lifetime choice award. Lifetime Achievement n nomination? Yeah, I wish. Okay. Right? No, it, it's a consultant's choice award. So they nominate specific awards if there's a category that they want to nominate that doesn't fall into another category. Okay. So I had made puppets, uh, like 28 of them, for mm. a production of Avenue Q. Wow. And... Because they're really the characters in the story, they're not actual just a prop. It's not the same as like finding a phone and finding right. a basket to yeah. dress the set. Right, the so right. they didn't want to nom nominate them as props because they were too intrinsic to the story. So they made them their own category and gave me an award for that, which was nice. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, so the reason why we're kind of adding Matt is because Matt, you have done a season that will show you were an Annie. I was not an Annie. I got you here and just being in Annie as Rooster. That was, oh, that was actually a long time ago. That was in a, a workshop okay. um, when I was much younger, but it's one of the only things I put on my resume. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> no, so anyway, we're well, going back to that. Yes, I was in Annie. It was not affiliated with Massasoit. It was actually with the, um, the Orpheus workshop um, back when I was 15. Okay, but this, is, so, but this is your actual first show with Massasoit. With, with Massasoit. Yes. And, yes. and what's the role that you're playing? I'm playing Fred, uh, Scrooge's nephew. Significant role. The optimistic, um, charismatic, yet stubborn and um, wonderful character. It's just it's so much fun to play, and especially it, to juxtapose um, Scrooge in, in, in every sense, to be honest. And we were, when Jen was staging me and directing me, which is such a lovely job that she does, and working with both of them is just right, phenomenal. Right, because they're co-directors. Co yes, yes. yes. Um, Jen staged my initial scene where I first come on stage, and uh, we kind of decided that you know, family-wise, there is no real family left between them. And whomever raised me or whoever was left, you know, raised me in a way that I go after Scrooge and I, well, go after Scrooge. I approach Scrooge every, every year, you know, and try to bring him to that Christmas spirit that mm. Dickens so beautifully describes in his works. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a blast. What made you, what made you uh, audition for this particular show? What was it about it? They called me. Oh, that's they what did. they did. Yeah, they reached yes. out to you. They reached yeah. out to me. Yes, um, I reconnected with our stage manager, Erin Thomas, this past summer, and um, they were doing some casting. And they said, "Why don't you come in and um, you know audition for us?" And I was like, "Sure, why not?" And uh, apparently, they liked it, and uh, it worked out. Is that what your thought process was this year? Was it different as far as the auditions? I mean, what was the process like compared to a year ago? Um, well. You really have to open the auditions to everyone and mm. wait and see who who, who comes to audition. And you work with who you had auditioned for you. And then sometimes if you're not finding the right person for a role, you have to reach out to uh, local actors and ask them to come be a part of it, which is what we did with Matt. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's worked out very, very well this time. What were your challenges this year as far as finding... I'm sure in your head you know who you want, the quintessential people. I don't want to say typecasting, but there's, you have you know who you want to see in particular well, roles and how you want to fill those roles. You know, Kevin, no, typecasting is a real thing. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yep. You, you have to be a type. You have to look it. right. Yep. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. It's just a fact of life, yep. you know. And if you cast outside of type, oftentimes the performance doesn't ring true because the person's not right for the part. Mm. Just because you can play a role doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be right. For no the matter role. how good they are. Yeah. You know? Right. Um, and I think the stumbling block for me, um, because we didn't cast it last year, you know, we wrote the script and then we went separately and she handled the costumes and I handled the scenery and we had a th another party, Corinne Mason did a wonderful job directing the inaugural production. Um, for me, the stumbling block, and it's always a stumbling block with A Christmas Carol, is Jacob Marley. Hmm. It is, because you need an actor who is good enough to play Scrooge mm but willing to do a character that's only on stage once. And it's super important to the story. Without him, the story doesn't go anywhere. Right. right? He drives the whole story. He's the reason these ghosts come to visit. He is the, the reclamation is his bringing to Scrooge, you know? And so if you don't find a good one, 
your, your show kind of stalls early on. You know, he has to be a strong actor. He has to be imposing. He has to have like a voice that has kind of this eerie resonance to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot that goes into it and then all of that for one zine. So for me, I think that's always the challenge yeah. with this show because yeah. everybody wants to play Scrooge and only one person can. You, you paint quite a vivid picture. I think a lot of people don't realize what goes into theater, whether it's theater, you go into Boston, you go into the city to see, or even a community production. A community production is just as important as in a big production. If not more important, if not more important sure. in some circumstances, I've seen some community theater productions that have blown Boston theater, you know, out of the that water. That goes without yeah. saying. There's so many theater groups on the yeah. South Shore yeah. that, that I that that you know what that they're worth the money you pay and and more. And, and you don't more. have to go into Boston and pay for parking. Right. I mean, everybody says that. Right? right. There you go. But that's fantastic. Right. And you know, I've worked at all levels, as have Nathan and Matt. And really and truly, no matter where you go, the process is the same. Mm. Two. Yeah. It doesn't know. matter if your budget is $600, your budget is $15,000, your budget is $2 million. Right. The process to get the product on the stage sure. winds up being the same no matter what you're doing. And I think, you know, to some degree, like Matt said, you can, you can see some pretty unbelievable community-level theater because it's amateurs. And for me, am amateur is a good word. It's people doing things because they love to do it. Sure. Yeah. It's right? a passion. Yeah. And so, and what you have, especially around here, you have a lot of people who went to school for theater, realized that it was going to be a really difficult lifestyle in order to make a living at, opted to go down another road, whether, you know, they're now, you know, running the day program at a nursing home, or they're, you know, working for a newspaper, or they're, you know, hosting crosstalk, y you know, whatever they might be doing, they still got the training, the same training that the people who are in New York have. Sure. Um, and so they're looking for outlets to do it. And so community theater is a way for them to still work their craft and hone their craft and also expose an audience that might not be able to afford the $200 ticket in Boston. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, to take a family of five to the theater today, you're looking at $1,000 plus parking plus dinner plus, you know, other, you know, trinkets with you buy at the show or whatever. But at a community level, you can do it, and you can, that same family of five, it could be $100, sure. which is so much more manageable. L mm -hmm. Let me kind of, I want to throw something else into the mix. And you mentioned it earlier, and that is, is that last year it was, you, you wrote the adaptation, and you let somebody else drive the vehicle. This sure. year, you two decided not only to drive the vehicle, but you're also doing other aspects. Jen, by design, you are somebody who does the costuming for shows. You're also doing that on top of being a co-director with Nathan. Nathan, of course, designing the, the set. Are, are there French doors somewhere in there? Or there no? are. They're, all, they're smaller, That's though. That's your trademark. I know. That's your staple. But talk to me about not only you have extra an a, extra aspect to it. What is it like to have be wearing those those different hats on top of watching this as it is coming together? For me, it's been interesting. Um, I've never done any any directing in theater before. I've seen it happen over and over again, and I've worked with lots of directors as a costume designer. Uh, so it's been really great. I'm kind of taking advantage of the situation that I have Nathan, because Nathan's done lots of directing. And so um, I asked him, could we do this together so that I could really just learn more about the process and learn more about my own craft. And um, so it, it, it's been eye-opening for me, I, and I really enjoyed it. And we're of like mind to begin with, so. Sure. Um, As you stated yeah. at the opening, that you guys yeah. do so much, you talk probably Every in the day. next hour or two, you guys are gonna talk about something theaterish, whether it's you know, oh. uh, the particular show now or something that, that is coming up. What is it like to work with, uh, you're not working just with one director, but you're working with two directors and all and, and the other jobs that they're doing, whether they're designing the costumes or they're working on the set. It has been the best process I have actually had in, in theater thus far. Nathan and Jen are brilliant when they how they approach things. And Nathan, you know, no offense to anyone else that I've ever worked with, is knows what he wants oh, from, yeah. from the he'll top get it. to the bottom and he'll get it out of you. He'll get it out of you. It doesn't matter if you're an amateur, it doesn't matter if you're semi-professional, it doesn't matter if you're a professional. Um, he knows how to work with people in order to unlock what he's looking for. 
And Jen the same way. You know, Jen, this may be your first time, but you know, she staged me on my first day and you know, we got it done in about maybe 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And it's like, if you have a good director and you have the good actors to work with, it's a bing, bang, boom process. Right. And it's been that so far. And I love that. Oh I hate, <laughs> right? Please yes, yes, way. it will, it will. Is this real wood? Um, I, uh, <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> I, I despise going to rehearsal processes that are so dragged out and they're so respectful of your time as well, um, which is huge. I mean, in a community theater setting, sometimes you're called and you're never utilized. Sure. Happens the same way in Boston theater. Happens the same way, you know, regional, Broadway, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, they've been fantastic to work with. And if I could just remind folks, take a moment to remind folks, the uh, show will be hitting the stage as of Saturday, November 28th. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Right. Uh, for three weekends, uh, the first two weekends will be just Saturday and Sunday. Sunday, of course, being a matinee, it is at... 2 p.m.? Is three. it th three. 3. 3 p.m. That 3 p.m. Yep. Sorry, I, there was a time it was 2 p.m. though, right? Yes. Just want to make sure I'm not, I'm not losing it here. And then I believe uh, the weekend of December 5th and 6th, actually, uh, I'm sorry, yep. December 11th, 12th, and 13th, it's actually a Friday, Saturday, right. and Sunday, correct? Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, if folks want to uh, find out information, I believe that credit cards are accepted now, right? Oh yes, um, we have online ticketing available now too, so you can go to www.massasoit.edu, the, the uh, address has been shortened, and then from on the home page at Massasoit, on the bottom of the home page is a menu so you can get around, and I think it's under Student Life, okay. and it says Massasoit Theatre. If you click that, it will bring you to the page where you can select your own tickets and order them. That's the most efficient way to do it. Okay. You can also call the box office at 508-427-1234. Um, we do not have a full-time box office staff, so leave a message, leave a message and we'll call you back. Um, or you can go into the box office Tuesday through Friday from 10 to 2 if you want to. Um, so those are the ways you can acquire tickets to the show. Um, we will also be appearing in the Brockton Christmas Parade this year. Oh, very nice. The morning that we open. So you can come down and see us there with 10,000 other people, and that'll be fun. That, that definitely will be fun. Let's talk about some of the other uh, characters, some of the other folks who are making this possible. First and foremost, you guys want to talk about, other than uh, having Matt here uh, starring as uh, Fred, who else do we have in this particular production, if you guys will? Well, we have a couple of people returning from last year's production. Um, Ethan Mantelos is returning as Christmas Present. Who's brilliant. Yeah, oh. wonderful. Brilliant. He was nominated for a Dash Award for his for role Christmas as Carol. Christmas Present last year. Really? Yeah. And he's returning this year. And then uh, Rini Rowe is reprising her role as the maid, Mrs. Dilber. Um, so we're happy to have everyone back that's coming back. And um, our Scrooge this year is a man by the name of Ron Perello, and he comes from Stowe. He's driving from Stowe to do the show. Wow, it's um, devoted. It is. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a commitment. Commitment. You know, any, any type of theater, whether it's you know, regional, community, professional, amateur, high school, it's all a giant time commitment. Mm. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that. I mean, these people are at the theater two and three nights a week, three and four hours at a time, sure. trying to make this happen. And, um, and he's driving an hour and 15 minutes each way on top of it. So when he comes to a five-hour rehearsal on Sunday, he's really spending you know, eight and a half hours coming to rehearsal right, on Sunday. Right. Um, he's going to be great. Christopher Hagberg from Quincy is playing Jacob Marley, and he's wonderful. We're very, very lucky to have him. Um, and we have a bunch of newcomers in the cast, too. It's really great. Um, and there's a student named Elliot Davidson who kind of came out of nowhere, who is wonderful. And very talented. Yep. And very. He, he listed on his resume that he was a, a master of dialects. And I was like, <laughs> we'll see. Well, he was not kidding. Yeah. Really? No, his, his British accent is perfect. Spot it's on. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it no, it, it's flawless. Um, so we're really lucky, you know, and the biggest difference this year will be the music. Um, our music director, last year, um, a gentleman by the name of Steve Shannon from Addington directed the music, and he did a really nice job, but we were kind of out of the gate and not really knowing where we were going, and, you know, this year, it's a gentleman by the name of Eli Bigelow, and he's planning to orchestrate the whole show. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, last year, it was a piano accompaniment, and this year, he's doing piano, drums, cello, violin, French horn, trumpet, and something else. And I don't is know this going to be all part of the pit? 
Yep. On on opening on the yes. opening night. It'll be live. Every, okay. Yeah, the music will be live. So he which is really, fantastic. That's yeah. a great element. Sure. And and he's really and he's more focused on. I mean, the show, it's a play with music, so it incorporates, it's not a musical. The music doesn't tell the story. It's, right. We incorporate a Christmas, traditional right. Christmas carols into the show. On the ambiance of the show. Right. What he's doing is he's taking it upon himself to underscore all of the scene work as well. Ooh. So it's instead, huge. Yeah, it's an unbelievable task, and he's really kind of chomping at the bit, as it were, to make it happen. Um, and we're very excited for that because he has some really great ideas about how he's the themology of it, and um, you'll have to listen to it to see if you pick up on it. But you know, different people's themes are different Christmas carols, and they start off you know kind of dissonant. And as the show gets more Christmassy, as Scrooge starts coming around, it gets more to a major chord. He's really, really kind of delved into it, and I think it's going to add a lot to the show. Um, and our hope always when we first produced it was that we would continue to work on it and make it a better piece of theater, you know, make it bigger. And from our perspective, I know at least from my perspective working on it this year, we learned a lot from last year's production on like, oh, there's a huge scene change here and we didn't account for that last sure. year. You know, I designed this huge you piece learned. of scenery. Yeah. You learned. Of Do course. Osmosis. Yeah. So now, you know, we get to revisit the script and go, oh, you know what? I don't think from a, from a text standpoint this worked. Right. So now we can, you know, reorganize it, move things around, mm -hmm. add things in to cover really long, clunky scene changes because the set's really gigantic right. and it takes a lot to move it. Um, so it's really been a process and the show's kind of developing, you know, this time. And I'm sure if we do it again in a couple years, it'll develop even more next time. You know, every time we'll bring something new to, you know, to the deck. Is there a, a plan to hope maybe do this on an annual basis? I think or is it a matter of, you know what, last year you probably didn't have the answer. You were like, oh, all right, we got done, let's rest, and we'll, we'll discuss next year when we need to. Is it something like that, or is it like you've, you're, you're already in it, you're like, oh, yeah, this is something that we could probably do? It possibly could be. Um, we'll have to decide about that after we mount this production and see how, how it goes. But it was interesting. One thing that I found interesting was we hadn't read the script for our, uh, nine months or so when we were getting ready to cast it. And so we read the script again, and we actually beefed some scenes up a little bit. And so what was great about us having written the adaptation, wherever we felt like it wasn't working well, like you just said, or we needed some more dialogue here, we needed to flesh this out a little bit more, uh, we were able to do that. So um, that's another interesting aspect of having written the adaptation is we can tweak it as we go along. Right. If I could kind of jump back to Matt real quick. And what I want to do is I want to add you in. Well, I think a lot of people don't understand what goes on behind the scenes of theater and, and the bond that forms as from, from first meeting uh, your, your, the other people that you're going to be on stage with to learning your lines, being able to interact, being able to feel feel out the person that you're working with, that you're going to be acting. Maybe you're going to be practicing with them. And you be, you develop kind of a, a bond, and it, it becomes a family. At least most casts will become a family. Am I wrong here? No. No, you're totally right. I think, um, I think I've had maybe only two or three rehearsals thus far, and everyone's great. You know, we're joking around, you know, obviously the inside jokes, can't say on, on the air, but it's fine. Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, we have a blast. We have a really, really good time. Um, the Elise, who plays my wife in the show, from day one, you know, we were bonded. And just from that moment on, it's like, ah, friend for life. That's what theater does. You know, it really, it, it's not just a, a cast thing, it's not just a show thing, but like if you can, you meet those right, meet the right people, sure. they can be friends for life, you know? I haven't seen Nathan in a while and all of a yeah, sudden we reconnected and that's just how it is. Probably how five years. Yeah, long time. Has it been five years? Five long years. time. What are some of the idi idiosyncrasies that you go through as an actor? Some of the things that yourself, that you're always trying to, especially with a role like this, that you're trying to, you know, grasp the particular character, make the character your own. What do you go through to kind of morph into that character? Oh. Is there is there a process? I think everybody's process is different, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, mine in particular, this is the first role that I've done that has an accent. Um, so I'm Cher. really... I'm sorry? Share. Oh, you have to pay. You have to come and see oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, good. No, no. <laughs> that was good. Very good. That, that's how it is. I, I mean, I'm a voice actor by trade. That's what I do for a yeah, living. That's what it says here. And yeah. um, so, you know, able to listen and try to create not only the accent, but to um, create the character as well. 
And that's kind of what I'm learning through this process. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of putting myself through a trial by fire and like listening to all these different um, inflections, you know, videos online. And there was um, a uh, how-to that you sent out as well that I've been kind of processing. Good, it's good. <clears throat> and the evolution is so much fun, you know, creating something that has an accent, you know, and very proper. You know, very proper accent. Very nice. So, so you don't have to pay. You, uh, you still have to come, though. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> we, we, get, we get about five minutes left. Is there any stone we have not unturned in regards to sharing uh, the second go around of A Christmas Carol, which is going to be at the Buckley Performance Arts Center mm -hmm. uh, coming this November 28th, starting for three weekends, uh, Jen? The, the weekend after Thanksgiving. So it which started. Is fantastic. Right. I, we, we always felt that um, people are in the mood to go do something like that at the beginning of December. Right away they want to go kick holiday off season. their holiday festivities mm. and it's a, a great opportunity to come and kick off your holiday season. What have the challenges been that you're looking forward to coming to fruition? What have the challenges been so far? Um, for me, I think uh, the greatest challenge is, is going to be or has been um, how we scripted it last year and what we did with it last year and figuring out what maybe didn't work for us and how to fix it. Um, and, and also not really knowing what the score is gonna sound like. Mm. There's been a lot of like, okay, we're gonna have the stop and go rehearsal so Eli can listen to the scene and figure out where he needs musical flourish under, under the scene. Like every time Christmas present sprinkles you know, from his torch, the Christmas spirit, there needs to be music every time mm. you know so i think that this is the biggest challenge right now is kind of working all of that in okay mm -hmm. matt anything you want to say in closing just to entice the folks to come, come and see the show ladies and gentlemen <laughs> it's going to be great no um the as i said the whole process has been wonderful um i really think that this is going to be something very very special uh, I, I know that they did it last year, but this year they have me, and they <laughs> just kidding. True. And and, you know, yeah, and they true. have Chris, <laughs> and they have you know all these wonderful, wonderful actors who I don't know if they were in last year. I know Ethan was, but I don't know if Chris was. Nope. Um, and so having people like that, you know, it's just going to make it you know a lot of fun. Okay, let's swing for the fence here. Let's give them all the necessary uh, information, uh, Jen and then Nathan. Uh, how can they find out more about uh, the show? Like to get tickets, phone numbers. Sure. Um, for tickets, they can go to Massasoit's website, which is www.massasoit.edu, nice and, and from the homepage, find Massasoit Theater, and that will lead you to purchase tickets. Um, if you would like to do that over the phone, you can call the box office Tuesday through Friday from 10 to 2 at 508-427-1234. You can also go in person. Tickets will also be available at the door. Anything you'd like to say to close out this, uh, this show? Uh, the only thing I think that might be a little different this year is we're really trying to highlight the humor that's in this story as well. So it's not such a serious, it is a story about redemption, mm -hmm. but Dickens wrote it with lots of humor and we're really trying to highlight that aspect of it as well. One more thing. Please. Scrooge is wonderful. It's a, it's a really interesting, honest take on the character, and this is something the audiences are going to be able to take away. Um, something not just so abrasive, but endearing, and um, you want to see you want to see him evolve. So, giving you that. Yeah. Well, listen. I want to thank uh, the three of you for coming and sharing, and uh, I can't wait to head on down to the Buckley Performing Arts Center. Make sure you get out and check out this production. 508-427-1234 is the number, and until next time, have a great day.
In Vietnam, we took care of each other. In combat, you look out for your battle buddy. I do anything for my unit. When things get tough, it's great to know somebody's there for you. Every step of the way. DAV stands behind America's veterans to make their transition back home easier with free services and help getting the benefits they've earned. Help us fulfill the promise to our men and women who served. Go to DAV.org to learn more.